But I want to talk tonight about what type of man? Kingdom man, okay? We're going to talk about a kingdom man. And so I got about seven points, a lot of, a lot I'm going to try to cover tonight. And uh, I'm going to try to get through it, all of it, because I got a whole other stuff I want to cover tomorrow. And uh, I prepare for these things weeks in advance. And so let's read the scripture. And I know you were standing, so let's all stand one more time. Y'all know how I like to stand for the reading of the word of God. Let's read our opening text, and then we'll sit and we'll jump into this. But Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 30, and it's the, it's the verse of this conference. And uh, oh, by the way, I had to make this Jesus shirt. You see Jesus all ripped? Okay. I'm tired of seeing them make Jesus look soft. They make Jesus look like a wimp. He was the king of kings. Come on. He was a strong man. And so go pick up your shirt. I got this one. I got the cutoff one because I'll be wearing it at the gym. Be like, that's how my Jesus is. That's right. So pick one up. Anyhow, anyway, Ezekiel 22, 30. The Bible says, so I sought for a what? A man. I need you to be very, very clear. Okay. We're not here to be chauvinistic, and so don't misinterpret what I'm saying. We're not dominating. Uh, we're to have dominion. But there is, no, there is a very clear call, clarion call in the Bible that God created the man to be the leader. And when the Bible here says he looked for a man, he wasn't just looking for anyone. No, he said, I was looking for the one that's supposed to be the leader of that home. The one who's supposed to be the leader of that family, the leader of that marriage, the leader of his life. He said, I was looking for a man. And the Bible says, among them who would make a wall or stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land. And it says that I should not destroy it, but God said, but I found, what does the Bible say? He found what? No one. Now, does that mean that there were no males? No, that's not what it means. There were plenty of males. It's just what God was saying is I didn't find the type of man that could actually change the legacy of that generation, which means God distinguishes between oh, just a male and a kingdom man. And tonight, I want to talk to you about how to be the kingdom man. The title of my message is The Making of a Kingdom Man. The Making of a Kingdom Man. So let's pray, and we'll get to work. Father, we thank you tonight because this room is filled with kingdom, with men. I know these are kingdom men because these men gathered, Father, to invest in the, in the identity you put in them. They're men. They're giftings you put in them. And I just want to say this to you. God wants you to be great. It's the promise of God. He told Abraham that she would, he would make him great, but not for our glory, for God's glory. Because when you're God's man, he will build you to the man that he has designed you to be. And so, Father, I pray tonight as we learn for some the first time, for others, maybe some reiterating things. And thirdly, for some that are going to see what the scripture says about being a kingdom man. That, Father, you would speak to us. You would build us up at all ages, all spaces, and all places through your word. So that we can take, Father, the place and the position that you've called us to be, which is men of God. Men that follow the king of kings. So, God, thank you tonight. Speak to us. Encourage us. And let us break those generational strongholds that have been in our families. And that, God, they will not be passed down to our children and our children's children. In Jesus' name we pray. Every, every man said amen. amen. Give God a hand clap and just tell two or three guys at your table, say, you are a kingdom man. Come on, just prophesy that. Prophesy it. Say, you are. You are a kingdom man. Just tell them that, all right? So I'm going to be up here, and I know some of the chairs are a little sideways. If you kind of want to move your chair a little bit so you don't leave with a, with a, with a neck ache, you're good with that. But I'm going to talk tonight about a kingdom man. And I'm going to start here with something that you probably know but still needs to be repeated is that manhood is definitely under attack. You know, it's, it's in our generation, Satan and society is literally trying to confuse what a man is. Where, you know, nowadays they say, well, what is a man? They're like, well, we don't know. It's what you feel. Fooey. That's nonsense, okay? And the enemy is working extra hard not to just, you know, uh, you know, transgenderism and all of this, this nonsense is, is really attack on manhood. Of course, womanhood as well, but it's attack to remove the man and the intricacy of really what is the foundation of society. It's the man is to tear it down. And, you know, this is really demonic because what Satan wants to do is, is, is almost look down on being a strong man. 
You see, society has no problem with weak men. But there's a problem when you start getting strong men. Because we have a generation today that will actually celebrate a gay man more than a man of God. I'm, am I talking right tonight? Now, if you battle that in your life, I'm not here to, I'm not here to beat you up. I'm, I'm here to tell you that there's, there's a call, there's grace. But our society is trying to beat up a man of God so much so that you could be a transgender man, that gets applauded. You could be a gay man, that gets applauded. You could be a woman trying to be a man, that gets applauded. But if you are a man saying you're a strong man, they say be a weak man. And we have to identify this, especially us that have sons, but even in yourself, that the, the world wants you to, to try to look at your manhood as a curse or at your manhood as, as, your, as, as something that is a, a, something that, that you were uh, 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 cursed with or is, is not, you know, uh, uh, not really looked upon. And so we get in our society and they'll tell you, you know, one side will tell you to be tough, but don't be too tough. Right? They'll, they'll tell you things like get in touch with your soft side, but don't be a wimp. Then society will tell you, you know, you look like every TV show, the man is always, the dad or, the, or the, the man is always the dumb one or, you know, he's the one that's useless or has no, you know, it's always the mom who has the wisdom and the dad's an idiot. And, and, and it's like, you know, we don't need you, but make sure you go to work and you provide. Talk to me, somebody. You know, and, and we get all of this stuff where it's like, we you know, we don't need you, but make sure you're at the ball games. Make sure that you take your wife on date nights. Make sure that you pay the bills. Make sure you, you do everything right, but, but you're a bum. And so then Mother's Day, they get flowers. Father's Day, we get, we get cards made at a paper. Talk to me, somebody. I'm not here to beat up the moms, but you know what I'm saying. It's like, hold up the phone here. It's like Mother's Day, they be getting all this. Father's Day is like, what are you going to do for me? It's like, excuse me? We have to notice this, and I'm here to call notice on Satan because it's a demonic attack. It is a demonic from the pit of hell to try to look down on what manhood is. And I came here to prophesy and tell you to your spirit, God made you a lion. He made you a man. He put gifts and talents inside of you to be great and to be the curse breaker in your family. If you believe it, shout amen. amen. To be prosperous, to take territory, to be a blessing. And that anyone who comes into your sphere of manhood or kingdom manhood is better because they know you. Tell the person next to you, I think he's talking about you. Say that, I think he's talking about you. Because that's how God started. Listen, again, I'm not trying to make you sovereignistic. Don't you go home saying, I'm the man. I'm, you, that's on you, bro. That's on you. But you could go home saying, I'm your man. Now you say that. And you don't get some points. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> show. That's right. Bounce chicka, wow, wow. Yeah. But, but <laughs> that's how God did it. Listen, it's the law of first mention. What's the law of first mention? Whatever God does first is the way he starts. God did not create a woman first. He created a man first. Okay. You can clap for that. That can clap for that. He created a man first. Okay. Why did God create a man first? He says because they go first. If the man gets it right, society's going to get right. Satan knows that. You've heard me say this before, right? It's, but I'll, I bear his repentance. I'm like, going to keep saying it to you. You are sick of me saying it. But it's, it's been proven. The Barn Group says that if a child in a family gets saved, the family is 7% likely to serve God. If the wife or the mother gets saved, the family is about 20% likely to serve God. But if the father, the man gets saved, the family is not over 90% likely to serve God. Did you hear what I just said? Over 90% likely to serve God. Do you know who knows those statistics? Satan does. So he goes, easy. I'll just go, I'll, I'll just play the statistics because the devil has, is a limited resource. He ain't God. He only got so many demons. He'll say, I'll just go after the guys. And if I make the guys fall, then I get the mother, the kids, the family, and society. So you got to know, you walk around, especially being here tonight, with a big target on your forehead. And Satan's like, well, that's the one I'm going to try to take out. Here's the good news. You got victory in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody. That's right. Say, I got victory. Come on now. Good. Come at me. Get scrappy with the devil. I wish you would. Come on. So we got to be a man. And I'm, I'm going to say this. You know, if you're here, I, I'm going to tell you 
because here's what Satan tried to do, try to tell you, well, you're, you're not a godly man because, you know, you, you messed up or you fell down. I mean, in this, well, I'm going to tell my own scripture in advance here. The Bible says a righteous man may fall, but he gets back up. What makes you a kingdom man is because you got back up and you came here tonight, and I want to celebrate you in Jesus' name, okay? So when the enemy takes out the kingdom man, it brings confusion and chaos. And you've heard the statistics but what 70% of, of men that are in prison are because they had no father. They have 70% have no father. 71% of high school dropouts are because they had no father. 63% of suicides in, in teenagers is because they have no father. Uh, you just all these statistics are overwhelming, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna bore you with them. And of course, we want to pray for those statistics. But the reality is that when a kingdom man is not present, are not present, there is chaos and there is confusion. And that is why in the verses we just read, the Bible says, context here, that God was looking for who? A man. He says, I am looking for a man who can build a wall. In other words, build a protection for family, for society, that can build protection, you know, uh, uh, for, for the future. He says, and someone who would stand in the gap. What does it mean to stand in the gap? That means I will do that even for people that don't, I don't even know in my life. I'll stand in the gap. And the Bible says he could not find one. What does it mean he couldn't find one? He couldn't find a kingdom man. And so this is supported in other scriptures. You know, I always like to say this. I don't make a doctrine of one scripture. Malachi chapter 4, verse 6. The Bible says here, it's on your notes. It says, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers, the hearts of the who? It didn't say the mothers. It says, if I could turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, he says, lest I come and I strike the earth with a curse. He says that if, if revival will come to us, to a nation, revival will come to a whole nation, he says, when there's a revival in the fathers who take their rightful place back into their place, and it will literally remove the curse of Satan in a society and a family lineage, you are a curse breaker, man of God. That's what the Bible says. That that's how revival is going to come. So again, what would Satan do? He says, well, I'll attack the fathers or the men. Isaiah chapter 3 and verse 12. The Bible says, as for my people, watch this. It says, there are, it says children are the oppressors or they're, they're oppressing people like childish. He says, and women rule over them. Oh, my people, those who lead you cause you to err and destroy the way of your paths. Now, what is being taught here is that the prophet Isaiah is saying on behalf of the Lord, he says that, the men have fallen out of leadership, and now the women are leading where the men should be leading. And he says, it has actually caused destruction in your path. Now, I'm not saying that women cannot lead. I believe in women in leadership. Women are powerful, and we want strong women. But it should never be to a place where the women lead and the guys are not taking their rightful place. The leaders in the church should be the men. We, ha we should have more men in leadership. Hello, somebody. The, the, you know, in our homes, like, we, we should be the ones leading our family. I have never, uh, my wife and I have never canceled a marriage where the wife said, I just wish my husband would lead less. They're always like, no, lead, man of God. And, and, and for you single guys, that's, that's the type of woman. She wants a husband that's going to lead her one day. And so the Bible is actually saying that. Because of the men not leading, the women started getting into leadership, and God was like, that's not the way I designed it. I designed it for a, a man to be leading in the home, a man to be leading in a marriage, a man to be leading his life. And so we got to make sure that we are the leaders that God called us to be. Say amen. Okay? Uh, write this down. Number one, what is a kingdom man? I got seven ways. We'll get to work here. So how do I become a kingdom man? What distinguishes the man that God was looking for? A kingdom man understands this. A kingdom man understands that his responsibility is to represent the king and his kingdom upon earth. So what differentiates a regular man between a kingdom man is that a kingdom man knows who he's representing on earth. I know who I'm here to represent. I know who I'm here on behalf of. Now, let's go back to the original uh, Genesis chapter 2 when God made man. And look what the Bible says. It says in Genesis 2.15, it says the Lord God, he took the man. And what did he do with the man? He did what? He put him where? In the garden. Now, why did he put him in the garden? To do what? To work it and what else? And to take care of it. So God was like, Adam... You are my representation on earth. You are the one that you're going to work and take care of it. Now, 
if you look at the context here, he wasn't just, when he said work it, that was, of course, to make sure that it was, it was a continuous, but to take care of it meant to protect it. Now, you might ask, protect it from what? It was just Adam. Eve wasn't even around. There was no, there was no, no, no nagging wife. Hallelujah. I got one amen out of someone. There weren't, there weren't no kids. There, weren't, there, wasn't, there wasn't no work. There weren't no job. There weren't no customers. There wasn't no, nothing. There weren't, it was just Adam and Simba. He was chilling. Take care of it from what? Ask me from what? From Satan. Because Satan had become a fallen angel on earth. And he says, I want you to take care of what I'm giving you and you're representing me. Because Satan had become a fallen angel, and now Adam was made in the image of God, and God was saying, you better take care of what I'm giving you because you're representing me. You're, you are a representation. You are a representative of God. Here's what a kingdom man understands. is A kingdom man understands everywhere I go, I'm here because I represent God. I represent his authority. I represent heaven, and therefore I walk under his blessing. Talk to me, amen. So that right there is the first step of a kingdom man, is am I trying to live for my reputation or God's representation? Because if you try to live to your reputation, you will actually uh, uh, compromise your Christianity for a reputation. To be socially accepted into circles where the truth is those circles don't let the devil bewitch you that you need to let go of your Christianity to get into a circle. If you feel you have to let go of who you are of God to get in a circle, you've already gone outside of the presence of God. If I have to let go of my, Christ, my, my, my belief, who I am, to be accepted by them, that's where Moses says, if your presence doesn't go, I don't want none of it. I want to go where your presence leads me. And when you represent God, and when he said, when you take care of it and, and you work it, that's when God said you will be, you will, he says you'll be fruitful and you will multiply. When you go and you represent God in your personal life and in your professional life, man, I'm telling you, especially you, all of us that, uh, you better work a job. I should talk about that. Get a job. You don't have a job, okay? It's tough out there. I was talking to somebody actually like, I don't have a job. I said, okay, this is what your job is this week. Your job is every day you're going to, is to put six applications in a day. That's your job. And for the next five days, you're going to go six times five. That's 30 applications. By the end of the month, you will have 120 applications. Your job is to get a job. Don't say, I got faith while, while you're eating popcorn, you know, while watching a, a Netflix series. That's not faith. That's fantasy. Get to work. Someone say, work it. He said, work it and take care of it, okay? But, but went a little tangent there. Anyhow, we all go in the corporate world. And I remember, especially when I got into the investment world, uh, you know, there was always the top brokers and, and, and again, this is this is a man's meeting, okay? And uh, during lunch, uh, whenever the team, whoever teams, they would put us in teams, whoever hit the most, you know, in investments, uh, the boss would take everybody on corporate time, paid for, to the strip club and all the drinks you can drink. He'd come get the limo, and he'd say, okay, winning team, we're all going to the strip club, paid for by the boss. All the drinks, all the food, and all that. Well, your boy's a hustler. So I was on the winning team. Everybody, let's go. You want to know what I did? I went back to my desk. Okay, before you clap, thank you for the claps. But they weren't clapping. Oh, oh my boss, are, what's wrong with you? Bro, this is paid for by the boss. Like, he's he going to give you a stack of a $1, $5, $20 bill. You, can, you do whatever you want. And I said, that's not who I am. That's not who I am. They would call me gay. They'd say, what's up, dude, are you gay? I said, nah, man, I'm married. They said, what does that mean? So what? Me too. I'm like, well, there's different things here, bro. I knew who I represented. I, you ain't hear me. I knew who I represented. And I'm telling you, if you feel you have to lose who you represent to be accepted, you have been lied by Satan, and he's going to rob your garden. He's going to rob your future. Well, since then, I've went on, and, and I've done what I've done now. God has blessed it. I believe why? Because I know who I represent. Someone clap if you know who you represent. 
clap like you're going to know who you represent. And so this is a, this, it's like starter. What makes you a kingdom man? I know who I represent. Watch this. Watch this. Not just in church. <laughs> Not just the, you know, get Sunday. It's like I represent the Lord. God bless. God bless. I know who I represent in the corporate world. Okay, let's go a little deeper. You know who you represent when you're on that business trip. You know who you represent. You represent Christ. A kingdom man knows who he's here on behalf of. Adam did not create himself. He didn't decide to be on this earth. He was created, and God said, you represent me on this earth. And as long as you represent me, God was telling him, you will be fruitful. You will multiply. You will have dominion. You will be blessed because you got God's hand on your life. I prophesied over you in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, be that Christian busy. Be that Christian family. So write this down. After every point, I'm have you write a question down, okay? Again, I'm teaching this seminar side. Now I get a little and I start preaching. But just, just write this down. And under point number one, do I, do I know who I represent? Do I know who I really represent? Because it's going to turn into table conversations over the next couple, over tomorrow. Are you more concerned about your reputation or the kingdom you represent? A kingdom man understands who he represents. I represent the king. Amen. Number two, write this down. A kingdom man is a man who has learned to live his life under the lordship of Jesus Christ. The Bible begins to tell us here, and I'm going to go quick here because I'm looking at the clock. I mean, the clock always wrestling. I wish I had two days. Oh, wait, I do. Genesis chapter 1. 26, God makes man in his image, right? The Bible says, then God said, who said? God. Okay, so we're going to go real, real, uh, uh, you know, precept upon precept, verse upon verse, verse real quick. And I'm really going to dissect the scripture here. But track with me. Use your pen and circle the word God said. Just circle the words God said. Then God said, let us make mankind in whose image? God's image. He says, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the wild animals, over all the creatures, and everything moves around the ground, right? And he says, so God created mankind in his own image, and then circle the word God. So, so again, right there, God. He created them, and how did he create them? Both what? Male and what? And female, he created them. Just underline male and female. You need to show this to your kids. Try to say there are a thousand genders. No, there's not. God dealt with that in Genesis chapter 1. He said, there's male and there's female. That's it. Yastubo, nothing more. Amen. Okay. Two genders, okay? He made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Male and female, all right? He created them. And so here he, he, God, God makes them, and, and he says, they're in my image. So who created them? God, right? Yeah. So God is creator. He's Elohim. He's creator. Then you go to Genesis chapter 15, one page, okay? Just one page, one chapter over. Then I want you to notice what changes here. Then the Bible says, then the what? The... Lord God, look at the word Lord God. Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Verse 16, and the, who? The Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good or evil. And when you eat from it, you will certainly, certainly die. Verse 18, then the, who? The Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone I'm going to bring him a suitable helper for him. I want you to notice that in Genesis 1, the Bible says God created. But in Genesis 2, when God's talking to Adam, he's now saying, it's the Lord who's talking to you. What's the difference? In order for a kingdom man to understand his assignment, you got to know who's the Lord of your life. In other words, I just am not asking God to create blessing in my life. I'm a kingdom man because I go to church and God, I want you to bless me. So I'm a kingdom man. I'm a kingdom man for the benefits. Everybody follow Jesus for free food and health care. Get it? Because he healed them and stuff. Okay, tough crowd. All right. So anyhow, so there, I, no, no. I don't follow you just for the blessings. I follow you because you're my Lord. And from Genesis chapter 2, God was telling Adam, you need to get this straight, buddy. Is I'm not just your sugar daddy God who creates things in your life. He says, I am the Lord, your God, and I am commanding you, don't you mess with that fruit. 
I am commanding you to take care of this garden because you're not in charge of your life. God is in charge of my life. A kingdom man knows who is in charge. And this is tough, guys. This is real tough because you already know. You're probably one of them. You're like, ain't nobody tell me nothing. Okay? I, nobody tells me nothing. You know what I mean? I don't want, I, I'd run my own life. And, 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 and you can be respectful to people, but the truth is you don't let God speak to you and tell you what to do. And, and I love you, but I'm going to say it, you know, is, is, is some of us, you're like an unbroken horse. You're like, God, you can't know. I will not let you use my life. And, and you're like, God, get out. And, and you've been doing that for five years, 10 years, 20 years, and you're frustrated. But the sooner you surrender and say, God, I'm going to be the person that you can just usher in your presence, be the Lord of my life. I'm telling you, that's the place of blessing. That's the place of security. That's the place a kingdom man knows who the Lord of his life. We're breaking it down from Genesis, somebody. Number three, write this down. I got to go quick here. Number three, write this down. Because our role is to know who is the Lord of our lives. Who is the Lord of your life? Right, Jesus. Actually, no, here's the question. And a question under point number two. Write down this question under point number two. Who is the Lord of my life? Just write that down. Who really is the Lord of my life? Because everybody wants a Savior, but not everybody wants a Lord. And this is a salvation issue. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, it actually says, it says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Savior, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is what? And so here's a soteriological issue. This is soteriology. This is a salvation doctrine. You're not even saved on your way to heaven until you actually let him be Lord of your life. You can save me. Well, God's like, well, am I going to be the Lord of your life? Because he says if you confess him as Lord, if you accept his lordship, then I'm saved. And so, again, I'm not trying to make you question your salvation in the sense where am I saved? But you better know, you better know for sure who's really in the driver's seat of your spiritual life. Okay? Don't be like, God, you can ride, you, can ride, you know, in the back. You know, you, you can ride in the middle, you know, because you're in the back. You know, it's like, no, no, God, you're in the driver's seat. Come on, somebody. So number three, okay, let's write down. A kingdom man understands that he is held accountable to a higher calling. Some will say I'm held accountable to a higher calling. It amazes me how many guys are afraid of their wives, but they ain't afraid of God. Oh, it's getting quiet up in here. Don't let my you're afraid of your wife getting your phone, but yet God has all access to your phone. Come on, somebody. You're afraid of your wife. But it's like, bro, 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 bro. This is backwards. She's not the one you should be afraid of. Because she does not determine your blessing. If you're right before God, you'll be right before your wife. If you're right before God, you'll be right before your kids. If you're right before God, you'll be right for, for your future. We are held, a, a kingdom man knows I live my life not because I'm afraid my wife's going to get found out because some of y'all think you're slick. I'm not sorry because of my wife. I, I, I'm a kingdom man because God holds me accountable to a higher calling and a higher purpose because I'm a kingdom man. Tell your neighbor, say, you're a kingdom man. And, say, and then tell him this. Put the fear of God on him and say, God's going to hold you accountable. Say that. Say it with a smile, too. And throw a bro in there if you're not bro. God's going to hold you accountable. Not me, you know, like, like God. And that's why I preach like I do because my job as a pastor is not to prepare you to stand before your wife. It's to prepare you to stand before God. It's not to prepare you to stand before, you know, some earthly politician. It's to stand before God. And so when you stand before God, the Bible tells us that we're going to have to give an account. We're going we're gonna to have to, we're going to have to give an account for what he gave us and how we stewarded it and how we managed that. And so y'all know the story of Matthew 25, the story of the talents, right, that, the, that, the, that the, the master gave. But let me just read this one verse here. It says, after a long time, the master of those servants, the Bible says, returned. And what did he do? He came to what? To settle accounts with them. At some point, and I do want to put eternity in your heart because it's scriptural, you will stand before God. You will not live forever. We are all but a vapor. Here one second, gone the next, okay? 
you know, the Bible says that we are but dust. But dust. That's what you are. But dust. Come on, somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's a men's meeting. I can say what I want. Okay. What you said on Sunday? No, but I'll say it at a men's meeting. Amen. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, you're but dust in this earth. That's what the Bible says. It says you're a but dust in the earth. That's the only thing you'll remember. How was the message tonight? It was hilarious. <laughs> That's all we are. We're here. The Bible says we're like, we're like a vapor. It's just, God, here. And some of us, get around someone that has silver in their hair. Tell them how fast life goes. How fast life goes. They just, I know right if you're like, oh, it's good. But, oh, you will wake up one day and you're like, I'm about to be 50. Someone says that's young. I know. Wake up one day, I'm 42. Y'all like, what in the happened? I'm like, no, you're not. Yes, I am. You, we will all as men stand before God. And the master is going to come and settle accounts with us. He's going to settle accounts with us. And the Bible actually says that, you know, when we get to heaven, that some in 1 Corinthians 3 says we'll, we'll literally enter heaven with, the Bible says, with, with uh, smoke on their back. Barely escaping the flames of hell. That's what the Bible says. Like, you will be the official smoky for all eternity. What up, smoky? You know what I mean? Like, you're smoky. Yeah. And some people are like, as long as I'm in, cool. That's on you. But the Bible actually says that in heaven, we will be rewarded for all eternity on what you did here on earth. God will hold you accountable how you manage your time, your talents, and your treasure. He will hold it all accountable. He'll say, he's, he's going he's to stand before God and he is going to reward you based upon what you did. And in heaven, he prepares a home, but not all rewards are going to be the same. Okay. God is going to actually repay us. And I can show you in scripture, if I had more time, and I will do on a Sunday, I'm gonna do, I'll do a whole sermon on how God rewards us, okay? The Bible says he's a rewarder. And when we get to heaven, some says that, some is going to uh, burn up, some's going to actually stay, and then some is going to last forever of what we did for his glory. But God's going to settle accounts. And a, and a kingdom man knows that if God gives me 100 years on this earth, that is like just a quick vapor of all eternity in heaven. And I live to a higher calling that God is going to hold me accountable. That is why I don't just want to waste time. That is why I just don't want to waste my talent. That's why I don't just want to waste my treasure. Like, I want to honor you. Some of you have spent more in Vegas than you have done for God's house. And you're going to stand before God's going to say, you blew more at the blackjack table than you ever did building the church. And yet we say, but God bless me. He says, nah, nah, bro. You in, but you can clean Pastor Tom's house. <laughs> Nothing wrong with cleaning house, but we're in heaven. Come on, somebody. When we get to heaven, it's, it's a whole, come on now. God is going to reward you, okay? And the Bible even says here on earth that God is going to bless people. I don't have as much time, so I'll just go quickly jump to the final verse. The Bible says in verse 29. Jump all the way to verse uh, 29 here. Matthew 20. Actually, I couldn't put all those notes in this. So I can put it on the screen. Go to, go to uh, Matthew 25, uh, verse number 29. It says, for whoever has will be given more. And it says, and they will have an abundance Whoever does not have in what they have will be taken from them because they didn't steward right. And then the Bible says in verse 30, and, the, and throw away the worthless servant in the darkness where he will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Why? Because he wasted time. Number four, write this down. I got to move quick. A kingdom man, what does a kingdom man do? A kingdom man fights for manhood. A kingdom man fights for his manhood. So someone say a higher calling. Okay, I'm, uh, let me go back to my own notes. Write this down. Actually, a question for number three. Write this down. Write this down. Write this down. Say, Am I holding myself accountable to my highest calling? Am I holding myself accountable to my highest calling? What is your highest calling? Our highest calling for every man is to build God's kingdom. That's the highest calling. You, we do everything we do, but are you holding yourself accountable to your highest calling? Number four, like I said, a man, a kingdom man fights for his manhood. What does he fight for? Manhood. His manhood. I've said this before, but it bears repeating. There are three there are three levels of every male, three levels of every male. You can write this down. I don't have it on your notes, but it's here. The number first one is when you're born, 
you get to decide. You don't get to apologize. You don't get to decide this one. But under point number four, write this down. The first one is malehood, malehood. So that's where God decides whether you're going to be a female or a male. When you're born, the doctor says, he's a man. Come on, somebody, okay? Very simple. The world tries to confuse it. No, it's gendered. No, man, it's a man. It's a man, okay? So you ever have any confusions, go to the restroom. If you see something there hanging, you're a man. <laughs> it's, it's that easy, okay? It's that easy, okay? And so you are a man. In that one, you don't get to decide. God decides it, okay? You're a man. Not about how you feel, all this nonsense. You're a man. That's the plumbing. You're a man. The next level as you begin to grow is you become malehood. You go to boyhood, boyhood. This, this level is where, you know, where boys are. They're immature. They're not responsible. And they're dependent on everybody else. Immature, irresponsible, and dependent on everyone else. They're fun, but they're immature, irresponsible, and dependent on everyone else. That's, you're still a boy. A man, manhood, and I've said this even to, I've said this to my son, and I've told y'all, but I'll say it again. Manhood is when people can depend on you, and you stop depending on people. That's when you step into manhood. I'll take the one clap and a burp. It's all good. Manhood is where you finally step in. You say, I don't need anybody to, I don't need to depend on people. People actually depend on me. I have the capacity to provide, protect, to, 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 to live in overflow. That is a kingdom man, is you step into that. If not, you stay in boyhood where you're still not able to provide, protect, and you need someone else. And whatever's stopping you, I just want to tell you today, there's a man in you because God made you a male. It's time to get out there and be the provider, protector, and priest of your home. Beast mode or priest mode. Let's go. And so we, that's what makes a man. And so if not, you stay in boyhood where you're still there. And we need more men in Jesus' name. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11 says, when I was a child, he says what? I talk like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, what did he do? I put what? Childhood. Where did he put childhood? Behind him. You cannot step into manhood until you put childhood behind you. You can't depend on mama your whole life. I'll take the three claps. You, get, you gotta step into manhood where now people depend on you. You're responsible, your, your spirituality. You, you are the priest, the provider, the protector. That is manhood. Number five, I'm almost done. Number five, a kingdom man, what does a kingdom man do? A kingdom man fights for fatherhood, and I even put grandfatherhood in there. We're the granddads in the place. We're the grandfathers in the place. Come on now, grandfathers. They say grandkids are the gift for not killing your kids. Congratulations. <laughs> okay. I, I was going to say something. I better not. Let me move on. A kingdom man fights for fatherhood and grandfatherhood. And that's what a kingdom man does. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6 says, train up a child in the way that what? He, he wants to go, he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. And, and so fatherhood, we've got to fight to make sure that we're raising our sons and our daughters for those that are fathers. Matter of fact, how many fathers are in the house? Raise your hand. All the dads. Look at all these dads. Let's go. Come on, somebody. And grandfathers and fathers. And for those that are single right now and you don't have any kids, I told you, you're, you are a papi to your wife, okay? You, you are her daddy, okay? It's biblical. That's what she tells you. She says, come here, daddy. And you say, I'm coming, baby. I'm coming. Okay? Yes, you are. Go ahead. Married, 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 married. All right. <laughs> but, you know, and by the way, just, I, I'm going to throw this in there. When... A, a woman, the Bible says, leaves their father and mother and cleaves to their husband. She's coming under your covering. So you are the headship over her. Now, don't get weird or twisted, but you become that covering that her father once was now comes under you. So when you're married, that, that's the first one that you cover like a father is your wife, you know. 
and uh, and that that is a blessing that's that she's under your covering and uh, that's why a, a woman is never supposed to be without a covering she goes from a covering from her father to the covering of her husband she was never meant to not have covering that's why there's broken women is because they're not that that, that there's no covering men just want to get them under the covers and leave it's a men's meeting right it's a men's meeting right and it's like, no, we're meant to be a covering. And that's what protects the women. Because men are the ones who are supposed to hold it all together. Yeah, you can clap right there if you want. So, a covering, right? Fathers and grandfathers, and I will say, let me talk to the grandfathers really quick. Is It's becoming more apparent how much more we need grandfathers to get back in the fight. Like, grandfathers to be in the fight... To help the to help parent the kids and to actually tell the testimonies and show the longevity that you can serve God for 40, 50 years. Amen. That you can share your stories of how you know you you have, have built your the the how you've built family and share the miracle stories. You should get your grandkids around and tell them about all the miracles that God has done. We need more grandfathers to be the patriarchs of families and instill the biblical principles. Right? You, you need to, you're the, you're the grandfather. You're the one who says during Christmas, before anybody opens a present, we're going to talk about Jesus. Nobody can say no to granddad. You, you, you're the one because, you know what I mean, you're the blessed one. They want your inheritance, so they got to listen to you. Come on, somebody. You tell them about Jesus. You're going to learn about Jesus. That's right. The, grand, the patriarchs, and I, I want to say, grandfathers, listen, you are so needed in the spiritual battle that we're in right now. Please, please, please don't just retire and say, well, forget those kids. No, get back in the fight. You help them parent. You pray for them. You, you, you instill the things of Jesus into them. We need the grandfathers. Clap for the grandfathers one more time in this place. Yeah, 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 yeah. We need the grandfathers. You're so important. You are so important. And of course, fathers, we need you too to be in this fight. And, and this is something that is a fight, right? It's a fight to raise our kids. It's a fight to, to, to be able to be involved. And so we, we want to do this. And so I'm gonna, I want to I'm gonna give you just four questions that I've been telling my kids to help father them that maybe you don't know because I understand sometimes you might not know what to talk about. So I have these four questions that I actually ask my kids when I spend time with them, because here's the real talk, and I'm going to say something that it's not going to be popular, but don't matter. i got to teach you how to father. Is just because you go to their games doesn't mean you're fathering them. Okay? I need to tell you. Just because you sit in the stands and watch them play a game doesn't mean you're involved in their life. You can actually go to every game but never have a meaningful conversation with your son or daughter. It's possible, okay? So let's not think that fatherhood is just me sitting in a game screaming at the ref. Because y'all know you scream at the ref, okay? And telling them, no, man, they should have played you. Like, that is an activity that's not meaningful depth fatherhood, okay? Don't misinterpret what I say. I didn't say that go to the games and do all that stuff, Okay? But if that's the depth of fatherhood, you're going to realize why you were always disconnected from your child. Here's meaningful conversation. Number one, you have to set up. Now, this is not the four questions. But number one, you have to set up an atmosphere to have the meaningful conversation. So it has to be a one-on-one. -on -one. I got four kids. I have a lot of busy work to do, okay? It's my, I'll take responsibility. Your boy had four kids. And miracles happen. We have four kids. Hallelujah. And uh, anyway. God bless that. Amen. So we love four kids. And so, but there's a lot of work, but you have to create personal time with each child. Okay. Like it's good to spend time with all your kids, but you have to have one-on-one -on -one time with each child. And you gotta, you gotta pry on them. You gotta, you gotta pry it out of them. All right. Especially as they start getting, asking older, start getting questions, even when they're young. Okay. So what are the four questions? I'm getting there. Okay. The atmosphere. But here's what you want to ask. And number one, the first question to your children. You ask them, what has been on your mind lately? What, is the, what has been the biggest thing on your mind lately? The biggest thing that you've been thinking about lately? Ask them, 
what has been, and they're, they're going to share something. It usually takes about the third thing is like the real depth, the deep thing. Sometimes it's the first one. What, what's, what's been really on your mind lately? What's been the biggest thing? And then I'm here. Second question. What, how can I be a better dad? Let them say, they might say, buy me more toys. You're like, yeah, you're out of your mind, but okay, cool. You know, give me a phone, not happening. Okay, get, buy me a car, sure. A 1984 Honda Civic coming your way. <laughs> That's it. How can I be a better dad? Number three. So what's, I want to make sure I get on for you. Number one, I told you, what's been on your mind lately, okay? Uh, how can I be a better dad? Number three, ask them. What are you most excited about right now? What are you most excited about right now? What are you most excited? What, what's, what are you most excited about? Because now you're part of their life. What are you most, you're going to be surprised. Some of your kids that are in sports, they're not going to name sports. They're going to name something else. Tell them, what are you most excited about? And you're going to, you're, now you're digging in there, right? What are you most excited about? And I say, no, I'm really excited about this. And just four simple questions that open the whole world up. And the last thing you're going to ask them for is, what can I pray about for? What can I pray about? How can I pray for you? Tell me something to pray for. And you're, you're always asking these questions. You can add, add more. I have a running list on my phone. It's, it's fight for fatherhood. What does it look like? That's what it looks like. It's, it's your, I want to father and have conversations that maybe your dad never had with you. Because our kids, man, I'm telling you, I was, they don't care what you're working on, man. They don't care, all right? They're like, I'll never forget my, 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 my son and my daughter when we first ever, they gave us a television program and I was literally on TV, okay, on TV. They didn't give a rip about it. To me, I was like this, they're like, so are we gonna, are we gonna play outside or what? They gave a rip about it. You think they care about the, the thing? I'm like, no. Y'all know I do, I do real estate and, you know, clo you know, writing transactions for my clients. And do you think they care how much that, they don't, they don't give a rip. They care about that. And so my wife and I did something because I know some of y'all think sometimes, well, I feel I'm not a good father because I can't give them the best vacation. Let me tell you something I did to my kids. Set them up. It's great. I actually looked up a Holiday Inn in Bakersfield. It was like a Motel 6, actually. Motel 6 in Bakersfield. It was like $49 a night. Okay. Check this out. Check this out. Yeah, that has bed bugs for real. I go, honey, let me show you how much the kids don't care. And I, I pulled it up on the computer. It's when they were younger. And, 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 I, and it, was like, it was like a little kiddie pool. You know what I mean? And, and I go, kids, guess where we're going for vacation? They're like, where? I said, you're not here. I'm going to show you this like next level. It's going to be so much fun. We're going to hang out. We're going to swim together. We're going to hang out. We're going to have fun. We're going to eat. Are you guys ready? Yeah. I turn around. I show them. They're like, oh, look at the pool. They were so excited about a Motel 6 in Bakersfield for $49 a night. Yeah. That's awesome. Huh? Stop putting that pressure on yourself. They just want to hang out with you. Speak into their life. Pray for them. Father them. Their attention. Because that are the things, I'm telling you, you fight for that fatherhood. When you're young, when they're young, your goal is to win their heart. Because when they're older, you're going to want to speak to their head. And if all you do is speak to their head when they're older, then you won't win their heart. Now, if you feel like your kids are distant, ask God for a miracle and say, I got to win their heart, their trust. Come on, clap because we have fathers in this room. Clap because we have grandfathers in this room. Shout, clap for fatherhood. We cannot train our children the way they should go if we're not involved in their life. We need to have these meaningful conversations with them. And uh, especially, man, man, not my kid, don't even get them down that road. Because, you know, I taught, man, I tell them, you know, who they're dating, their friend, all that stuff. Like, like, Lord Jesus, be with us all. In the name of the Father, Santo, Hijo, Espíritu Santo, be with all of us. Amen.
Number six, I got to wrap this up. A kingdom man fights for his future. I see what time it is. Don't worry, we're going to eat. Got wing, we have wing stop here tonight. We got some wings coming, so don't worry. Y'all going to grub on some Parmesan, garlic. Yeah, don't, we're going to eat. Don't worry, we're going to eat. We're going to eat. We're going to eat, okay? Then we're going to do some other stuff around, so all the competitions. We got food. Someone said a kingdom man fights for his future. Oh, I forgot about the question. I go back to my notes. The question you're going to write down for fatherhood. Write this down. Am I a present father? Am I a present father? Meaning, are you present? Are you, like, speaking and having meaningful conversations? Meaningful conversations. What are you most excited about? What have you been thinking about? What's been on your mind lately? How can I pray for you? How can I be a better dad? What can I do? You know? And it's not expensive for this stuff, too, by the way. You can go get a, a, a dollar donut and have this conversation, okay? Put four quarters together at the donut shop. That's what I do with my daughter. Number six, a kingdom man fights for his future. The Bible says here in Exodus 34, 23 and 24, it says it was in the Old Testament a requirement of every man, but the Bible says three times a year all your men are to appear before the sovereign Lord, the God of Israel. He said, I will drive out nations before you and enlarge your territory, and no one will covet your land when you go up three times each year to appear before the Lord your God. And so what this literally was, was God was calling all the men of Israel to come up to, to, to basically to come out of. So that means, think, think about this, there was no men in their villages, and they were almost vulnerable, but God was like, I'm calling all the men together. It's kind of like what we're doing tonight, like a man's conference. All men, he's like, I'm calling all the men together, and you're to appear before me. Why? Because God wants to speak to you about your future. A kingdom man knows, God, I need you because some because I don't know what's in my future, and God, I want you involved in my future. I've said this, it's easier to give God your past, but it takes a lot more faith to trust him with your future. When you start saying, God, I want you in my life because I want to honor you in the next steps I'm going to take, and I want to come before you. And the kingdom man fights for his future and doesn't give up. Proverbs 24, 16 says, for a righteous man falls, how many times? Seven times. But what does he do? He rises again, or he gets back up, but the wicked shall fall a calamity. And that's why a kingdom man keeps coming back, keeps coming back, whether it's a man conference, whether it's a Sunday service, whether it's a Wednesday worship, whether it's a connect group, you're like, I'm going to keep coming back because I'm going to trust God, I'm going to fight for my future in Jesus' name. Tell the man next to you, fight for your future. Say, get God involved in your future. I don't know what your past has, but I do know this. With God, He can change and give you a hope and a future in Jesus' name. He could change the future for your marriage, the future for your children, the future for your life, the future for your mind. Okay, I know you can't change the past, but you can rewrite the ending. Let's go, somebody. Totally. God can turn it all around and restore it. And last but not least, a kingdom man fights for his family. He fights for his family. I'm going to read this last verse and I'm going to give you an example here. But in this last verse, well, let me read 1 Samuel 36 and then we'll go to 1 Samuel 30 verse 7. It says, but 1 Samuel 36 says, now David, I've been, re I've been reading this verse on the series, been doing on emotions, but it says, now David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. It says, but David, what did David do? He what? He strengthened himself in the Lord his God because he knew he had to re recover what his family had lost. But watch how David strengthened himself. Go down to verse number 7. It says, then David said to Abathar, he says, the priest, Abimelech's son, he says, please bring the ephod here to me. And, Ab and Abathar, the Bible says, brought the ephod to David. And what the ephod was, it was literally a priestly garment that represented worship. And it actually had 12 stones on the, on, on the garment or like, like a vest, 12 stones that represented the nation of Israel. It represented all the families of the nation of Israel. And what David was doing was he says, I'm going to go seek God for my family and the family of all those that are connected to me. And he literally would put this on as, a, as an example. And so can you bring this to me? I got this here. And he would put this on. Let's go, somebody. As an example. This is a men's meeting, right? It's all the ladies. They shouldn't be here, but they're here. They're here.
David was like, you know what? Before I go try to fight for what the devil stole from me in the past, he says, let me put on the priestly garment. Let me put on the ephod and go into the presence of God. Now, this here is a bulletproof vest. It's what people put on before they go to war. You don't want to go to a soldier that goes to war without something like this. You are more vulnerable to attacks and the bullets, but this protects you. There's something that happens when a man says, I'm going to get into worship and I'm going to put on the priestly garment. I'm going to put on the armor of God. Come on, the breastplate of righteousness. I'm going to wear the helmet of salvation. I'm going to wear the boots shot up in the gospel of peace, the belt of truth, the shield of faith, and the sword of the spirit. What happens is now you're not going into battle on your own strength. You're going into battle with God's strength. And you are soldiered up to fight and recover everything the devil stole and now you're covered and anointed and appointed with an authority to take back what the devil stole when your kids were younger when in your past years in your previous years and now you're not just a playboy man you're a kingdom man who's gonna build God's kingdom in your life and everyone around you and I declare it not only will your family be saved but your neighbor's family your brother's family your cousin's family your uncle's come on all one around you because you're gonna be the kingdom man to break generational strongholds if you believe it give God a clap and shout hallelujah I want you to stand to your feet right now and we're gonna pray God I thank you Lord because What's happening right now is these kingdom men are soldiering up. They are literally putting on their armor of God because we have tried to bring change in our own strength and it never works. But when we do it on your strength, God, that's when change really happens. Father, we're not just going to try to fight it as men. We're going to fight it as kingdom men. Men that are wearing the armor of God men that realize who we represent we're kingdom men kingdom men that know their higher calling kingdom men that know who is Lord kingdom men that are willing to fight for their manhood we're in a fight for fatherhood we're in a fight God for their families we're in a fight for their future we're not just gonna be those guys that wash it all the way so every man right now, I want you to lift your hands towards heaven and repeat this prayer to me. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for making me a man. But now I choose to be a kingdom man. The scripture, say, the Bible says that you looked for a man and you couldn't find one. Well, Lord, here am I. I use the words of Isaiah. Send me. I'll be that kingdom man for my family. I'll be that kingdom man for my future. Say, I'll be that kingdom man for everything you've called me to accomplish. And say, Heavenly Father, I now realize that a kingdom man knows who he represents. I represent you. Say, a kingdom man knows who his Lord is. And you are my Lord kingdom man knows who's in charge and that's you God say in Jesus name I pray